I'm joined by Harry Littman of the Talking Feds YouTube channel, the Talking Feds podcast. Make sure you subscribe to both. Harry held senior positions in the Department of Justice. He was a United States attorney in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Harry, I thought it'd be important that we show our viewers the anatomy of some of these Trump appointed judge decisions that I think are creating real havoc and chaos in our society. We often talk about it, the universal, we abstractly, here's a decision doing this or doing that. I want people to look at these decisions so they can see the language that is being used. Knowledge is power here. And I want to get your perspective on this decision. Now, I could show a myriad of judicial rulings, even over the past 48, 72 hours, but I want to focus on this one. It's a federal judge last week overturning Illinois' ban on semi-automatic weapons. The judge is a Trump appointee, Judge Stephen P. Miglin. The uh, Illinois legislature and Governor Pritzker, who signed this into law, something called the Protect Illinois Communities Act, signed into law January of 2023. It took effect January 1st, 2024, and it banned AR-15 rifles and similar guns, large capacity magazines, and a wide assortment of attachments, largely in response to the 2022 Independence Day shooting at a parade in the Chicago suburb of Highland Park. We all remember that horrific incident, that mass shooting. So with all of that in, as context, this uh, Trump-appointed judge struck down the Illinois law and said AR-15s, weapons of war, they should be allowed. I don't care about what went down at Highland Park. This is something that these are the types of weapons that people need to have. But if we just ended our analysis there, I think people would be left knowing, can you show me the ruling, though? Show me how this judge communicated yeah. this. So let's just I take get a look there at, from here. Yeah, let, 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 let's take a look at what this judge. This is, again, federal judge, Trump appointee. Here's how he assessed that framing that I just gave everybody. Here's what he says. Why are all why are there small lifeboats on gigantic steel ocean liners? Why do we spend thousands equipping our vehicles with airbags? Why do we wear seatbelts and place our infants in safety seats? Why do we build storm shelters under our homes? Why do we install ground fault interrupter outlets by sinks and bathtubs? Why do we get painful inoculations? Why do we voluntarily undergo sickening chemotherapy? And why do we protect ourselves with firearms? In life, we face many perils. Some are natural, whether phenomena such as hurricanes, tornadoes, or floods. Some are biological, such as viruses, diseases, or malignant cells. Some perils are associated with important products like electricity, natural gas, matches, automobiles, and pain-relieving medications. Too often, the perils we face are forced upon us by other people, by people who are negligent, reckless, insane, impaired, or evil. Sometimes it is the proverbial lone wolf. Sometimes it is the whole wolf pack. Truly, life comes at you quickly. And who comes to our aid in times of peril? Sometimes it is the police or first responders. Other times it is healthcare professionals. And sometimes it is family, friends, or neighbors. Sometimes it is no one. I, I kid you not, this is what it then shows. It's this photo right here. Rabbit and duck illusion. What do you see? And it's you see it right there in its original German. This illustration posits the question on the top line, written in German. Which two animals are most like each other? Beneath the image are the words rabbit and duck. The image distinguishes perception from interpretation. If you see only a duck, your interpretation of the data is too narrow. Yet once you become aware of the duality of the image, your interpretation of the data allows you to see both a duck and a rabbit. This image illustrates the way in which perspective and context enable one to see the same information entirely in different ways. The AR-15 is a Roshark test of America's gun debate. In listening to the political debate and in reading various judicial interpretations of what the AR-15 represents, it is obvious that many are seeing very different creatures. Many see one, but not the other. Our task here is to understand that data. 
And then he goes on to say the AR-15 is really a weapon of uh, something that's needed in self-defense. Self-defense. So, 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 Harry, I mean, they then go and they cite the opinion a few years back that Clarence Thomas wrote the Brewer decision where Clarence Thomas talks about historical context, which is basically this kind of arbitrary test where a judge looks back at history and goes, is this a weapon that would just be used exclusively for military? Or if this, based on historical models, when these weapons didn't even exist, or could this weapon be used for non-military purposes? And then they do some vague balancing and then they come up with their conclusion. So I thought it was worth it to show how these judges are reconciling these things that are causing mass shootings and leading to it. And when you see it in paper like that, it's like, what? They're doing photographs of ducks and, and freaking squirrels? What, what, what are they doing? Harry? Yeah. What is Man, I think it's a really great uh, example. As you say, there are other ones, but it illustrates so much. So first, right? This is a guy, he's now a federal judge. It illustrates the whole problem of Trump now um what happens in a victory when he actually has to run the government what does this opinion have nothing to do with the law and what does the law have everything to do with including the Bruin case from justice thomas is the balancing of what's a reasonable regulation uh in view of the terrible social harms that an ar-15 does again and again and again and he has not only has he not even uh, attempted to come to grips with that, which is the question, but you can see, right, the danger of, like, to, to not mince words, crackpots on the bench. This is a guy who I'm sure, uh, I don't know if his background is academic or lawyerly, but, you know, he would have this kind of uh, conversation, uh, you know, around a cocktail table, but it's just not law whatsoever. And you have um, guys like this now who are, this is the fight. We all focus on the Supreme Court, but even in these last few weeks, it's going to be a bitter fight for every single federal district court judge. Uh, the Dems are going to try to get as many as they can. The Republicans are going to try to block as many as they can. And here's what are the stakes. You now have individual people, not simply for an immunity opinion, but guys like Matthew Kaczmarek, who with the Mepha Pristone case and district court, Eileen Cannon, district court judges here and there who are just wackadoodle. You know, nobody would read this opinion and think it was anything like law, but now the guy's got a robe, he's got life tenure, and somehow the, the um, people of Chicago and the governor of Illinois, beset with all these problems, have to listen to this guy, go up to the Seventh Circuit and hope for a good panel because now we have a bunch, when you, Trump judges have been so carefully selected and curated for extreme views. There are just aren't that many judges out there and some of them are plain old whack jobs. So, you know, that he could even think this guy on, on the doctrine, nothing at all to do about um, the reasonable <laughs> regulation, what society can do. No resemblance even to the Bruin case, the historical analysis there, the duck rabbit idea that you can see the data in both ways. What a judge does is hear the data and then explain, is this a reasonable regulation under the Bruin case? Or isn't it? This this instead is like the cartoon before the movie, but it is now the law. It's uh, you know until it goes to the Seventh Circuit, and the more Trump judges you get, the more possibility of just simple departures from derogations of what you count on the law in its workaday mode. As you said, you could have done two or three of these in the last um, week. And yeah. the more Trump judges there there are, you know, it's not simply extreme views, though that matters, but but it's just, you know, non-judging. And man, oh man, oh man, all three, if if the Republicans hold on to to the House, all the all the three elected branches are there. You have the Supreme Court. Just yesterday, I think it was, a Obama judge said, No, I'm sorry, you can't put the Ten Commandments up in the classroom. You have some people resisting and applying the law. 
but others not. And that's going to proliferate. And really, you know, the points of kind of pushback get fewer and fewer. You know, Harry, one of the things that was very difficult, especially when I was a civil litigator, yeah. was I would build up, I thought, a great case. I would get all the right witnesses and experts and put everybody in place. And I would have a client who relied on me and depended on me. Yeah. And we would make these arguments. And, you know, maybe I first filed it in state court, but I had a federal 1980 section 1983 claim. So it got, you know, removed to federal court. And then I would get assigned a judge in a certain area. And you almost, even if it was the central district of California, or certainly more likely in the kind of Eastern district of California, but other districts, central district you, too. Central yeah, district too, right now. Yeah. yeah, you know, you you know, you would say to yourself, "There's almost nothing I'm going to do to win this case." But then the clients relying on you to make good on all of your promises and invest in the experts and do the whole thing. But ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to lose at the district court. I got to hope that I get a decent panel in my appeal, you yeah. know. And all of a sudden, a case in your own mind goes from can I get this before a jury in two and a half years to this may be a 10 year ordeal. You know, my client's not going to see justice if ever, you know, until 2035. And, you know, and, and oftentimes you put a case like this in front of a judge who's doing duck squirrel, you know, chipmunk analysis. And you're like, I, I don't know what, to, I don't know what to say. That's, that was to me when I was practicing, the, the hardest part for me to, to do. Yeah, and let me put a finer point on this. Who's the client? The people of Illinois, the governor of Illinois, who are petrified that their kids are going to get mowed down in school. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the oral argument in front of this uh, clown was not about ducks and rabbits, right? So you feel like you're not even listened to, and then he does it seems almost kind of funny and eccentric. It isn't. It's arrogant to think that this kind of bizarrely idiosyncratic, law-free cocktail party conversation, and not even good cocktail party conversation, would substitute for a litigant and here a state's right to have the law apply to them, to at least have, if you're the Seventh Circuit here, you, you hardly even know what this guy has done. That's that's just uh, a real, and we're talking now about AR, you know, not a small issue that concerns only a civil defendant, but Illinois, terrible gun problems, et cetera, and you know that you ha the circus comes to town with this guy, and it, it's just, you know, you have a right to a legally reasoned decision, and this guy has not delivered it. Everybody, make sure you subscribe to Harry Littman's YouTube channel, Talking Feds, more important now than ever. Harry Littman and I, Harry, we got a lot to discuss too. We got we to gotta make sure we grow these platforms because, yeah. you know, look, uh, right now people need this type of legal analysis um, and they need to understand what they can do. So you and I are going to do it. One of the first things our audience can do here at Midas Touch is subscribe to Harry Littman's Talking Feds. And then Harry and I are going to start rolling out other initiatives. So, Harry, thank you so much for joining, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, see you soon. Look, you know, I, I don't think the cable channels are doing anything or are going to be able to do much. There's a lot of political hand-wringing. But to actually, you know, remind, underscore, insist on the what, you know, what the law is supposed to provide, that's something that hopefully we'll, have, we'll be able to keep going one foot in front of the other on for several years <laughs> and subscribe we're in this together let's do it thanks thanks for tuning in if you enjoyed this video and other talking feds content please take a second to like and subscribe talk to you later